Okay, and you can still hear me well? No background noise or anything? No, it's good. So, hi, it's uh, Ted Ritzer. I'm the host of the Greening Government Webinar Speaker Series. Uh, the Speaker Series is a collaboration between my department, Alberta Environment and Parks, the Alberta Climate Change Office, and the Municipal Climate Change Action Center. And the, the goals of the series are uh, to help governments uh, reduce their carbon footprint and uh, to grow their green economies. And today we're very fortunate to have Dr. Uh, Norman Jackness, uh, who's a prof at, uh, at New York's Columbia University. Didn't find that out until just before we've, uh, we've uh, broadcast here. And uh, Norman has been associated with the Intelligent Communities Forum for quite some time. And uh, uh, recently they actually identified both uh, the city of Edmonton and uh, prior to that uh, Parkland County essentially for awards for best practices in uh, being an intelligent uh, community. So today we're really fortunate that, uh, th that Norman has agreed to present and uh, I will turn it over to you, Norman. Thanks so much for doing this. Well, and thank you very much for having me and, and uh, I'm glad to speak to folks in uh, some of our favorite communities. Um, I'll go into a little bit more details. Uh, it's in more than best practices, but I'll get to that. Let me just say that uh, I have a lot of slides here, a lot of material. Um, I don't tend to read all of them. Um, so I'm making this available um, uh, through TED. Uh, if anybody's interested in uh, reading some of the details on some of the slides that I go through fairly quickly. Uh, having said that, let's get started. Um, First, I want to just introduce uh, what ICF is about uh, and what intelligent communities are. ICF itself is, is a global network, um, actually primarily outside the U.S., um, of uh, cities and towns that have been recognized as intelligent communities, and that includes Edmonton and Parkland County um, and Toronto and actually a bunch, and Montreal, which won, and I think it was last year, and a whole bunch of other places. So, um, and, and we're also a think tank. We try to, we, we have people fill out extensive uh, application forms uh, to be recognized. Um, and we try to learn from that and make uh, that available. Um, as I said, it's, uh, we have 100 cities right now, actually more than that, uh, and metro areas and counties uh, across five continents. And populations range from 10,000 to 8 million. Actually, now more than that, I just come to think of it. So I'm going to say uh, close to 20 million. Anyway, um, we, we produce books. Uh, there's a series of books that you can see on your left. Um, we, um, we run a community accelerator workshop in which we work with uh, communities for a day and a half or so to help them figure out uh, what kind of strategy they should pursue and sort of what specific things they can be doing in the next three to six months to become more of an intelligent community. Um, we, uh, we have these institutes for the study of the intelligent community, uh, a couple of them going on now, and we're always looking to do more, where we're associated usually with universities, um, so they can help uh, provide additional assistance to communities. And we have ICF nations, and it turns out that, that uh, right now, we just started this, right now, uh, Taiwan and Canada are the two places in the world that have, if you will, a sub-association of ICF uh, just for their countries. Um, and uh, one in Canada is very active. Um, so if you're not already involved with that, you might want to consider it. Uh, we also have our summit. I'll go into that in a bit. So I mentioned to you that the uh, Community Accelerator is there. This, what we're sort of talking about today is kind of a teaser, if you will, for our usual workshop, which goes into more detail and is much more interactive. Um, this is what we're most famous for, the annual awards. So there's the first, the Smart 21 Communities of the Year. Um, and, uh, and then that's winnowed down to the top seven and finally the most intelligent community of the year. We hold our summits annually. Uh, this uh, past uh, June, we held it in New York. Next year, it's gonna be in London. Um, these are the dimensions that are used in our rankings. And, and, and I you know, want to draw a distinction here. You've heard a lot about smart cities. We're not really talking about smart cities. A lot of that is concentrating on, on deploying tech tools for government, things like sensors and, and street lights and so forth. We're really talking about how to use technology intelligently to build community. And so we focus on these six dimensions. Um, um, obviously, having the broadband as a foundation, but going beyond that to the uh, workforce, uh, whether or not they're prepared for a knowledge economy, uh, innovation, digital equality, uh, sustainability, uh, obviously, it's just important to this group as well, and advocacy and leadership, as we really call it, um, for, uh, for these things happening in the community. 
Um, and there's a rather elaborate process we use in evaluating all of these. We have a panel of um, uh, both initially uh, a dozen analysts uh, going through this material and then uh, close to 100 judges from around the world. Um, one example, and for example, in sustainability, just to give you some, some detail, these are the kinds of things that we're looking at um, in terms of the way that the sustainability plan exists and it covers all sorts of things from the use from the things you would expect like carbon reduction projects, but even to the way procurement is happening and the way property development is planned. So technology is a foundation for a lot of what we talk about. Um, uh, and so you just want to go through this because broadband actually has had a big economic impact and there are a variety of statistics about this. Uh, I think the, uh, uh, the second and fourth point here, I suppose I should have made, put them in a different order, are the most important. Uh, the increase in local GDP is more than tenfold the value of investments in broadband infrastructure that has been found uh, through a variety of economic studies. Um, and, and even going back to 15 years is you know, going back to 2010. So this is not even more recently, that 21% of the economic growth in developed countries came from the internet. So this is important stuff. Um, for, for those interested, particularly in rural areas, the Hudson Institute did a study, and this is in the U.S., but I think Canada is uh, similar in this respect, um, that uh, rural broadband contributed $24 billion to the economy uh, in 2015 when they did uh, the study. Um, in the U.K., uh, the government there uh, has pointed out for every pound that they invest in broadband, the economy benefits by 20 pounds. Uh, and, um, and, and in fact, uh, uh, I keep this article up from, you know, four years old now, but still it's important. Uh, this is from the New York Times Economic Reporter, and he really pointed out that the, the impact is not all being measured. Uh, the example I like to use is when Encyclopedia Britannica was around there, a couple of billion dollars a year, I guess, of sales were included in the gross domestic product. Um, and then when Wikipedia came along, the Encyclopedia Britannica is a shadow of what it was. Um, everybody has access to Wikipedia. The, the, the use of encyclopedias is much wider now than it ever was. Um, but the economy actually shrank from that because Wikipedia is a nonprofit and has a fairly small staff. Um, and in Europe, they've mentioned this as well. This was a study done by the European Union and basically pointed out that uh, uh, I think on the bottom uh, that um, there's a positive effect of high speed broadband, but not all the benefits are being measured or monetized. It's an important thing to remember as you're talking to people and trying to explain the value of these kinds of investments. Uh, but broadband and technology, while they're necessary, are not sufficient. And that's one of the things that's very much a part of, uh, of what the ICF has been trying to tell people. It's, uh, uh, you can lay the fiber, but you know, if people aren't using it to get value for, in terms of building their community, uh, then it's really not worth the investment. So, you know, we, we, and we talk about the, the foundation, you know, this going beyond this uh, t technology for the broader foundations. And, and, and really, it's where leadership and collaboration and a focus on long-term sustainability are important. That's what we've noticed in terms of the successful communities. I think also, you know, we talk about success. The last point is really important. Uh, one of the things that we look for is how communities have come back from problems that they've faced. Uh, how they come back from failure. It's an important part of, of uh, having to deal with uh, a world that has some dramatic uh, changes and disruptions for us. Okay, let's still talk about a little bit long-term economic trends. I'm trying to set the picture for you. We'll, we'll, you'll, you'll get to what the uh, implications of all this are in a minute. Um, so um, uh, one thing I would say is that this uh, part of this picture is that the, uh, the, uh, a new connected countryside is part of the foundation of a green economy. Um, and, and that's because uh, traditionally, if you live in remote areas, you needed to use an automobile to get to a whole bunch of things that were important, like a job, uh, healthcare, educational opportunities. Uh, now with broadband, uh, you, you can reduce that kind of travel. Um, and in fact, um, um, you can make uh, networks, power networks even, which are big users of, of uh, or, or big emitters of greenhouse gases, you can make them smarter. And I think a wonderful example of this you may have heard Chattanooga, Tennessee has broadband in its region, not just the city, but in the seven county region, including very rural areas. Um, they did that actually initially not to provide broadband, but to uh, create um, an intelligent uh, network for power. And now they have both. Um, so the other point about economic trends is an increasing percentage of people can make a living providing intangible products and services, right? So this is being delivered over the internet um, and that obviously reduces the amount of physical movement for a lot of things. 
um, and it opens up opportunities. So there's, uh, there's, the result is there's been increasing service employment. I think, whoops, did I eliminate that? I guess this is, this is a picture uh, that compares uh, uh, the European Union and the US. I had another slide, which I guess I've deleted, sorry. Um, there is almost a reverse in the US employment. There is almost a complete reversal of, uh, uh, of the labor force. So roughly 75% of the labor force in the year 1900 was in the business of making goods and food. Um, and, uh, and now it's completely reversed and 75% of labor force is in services. Um, same thing is true in Canada. Hopefully, I thought I had that slide, but I guess not. Anyway, the same, but the same percentage is true for the uh, Canadian workforce, and I've uh, lost that slide. Sorry about that. Anyway, and it's not just service, but it's knowledge workforce. So this is going back almost 10 years ago, uh, and it was a study done in the UK, uh, and basically found roughly, uh, you know, you can see the numbers here, uh, the number, percentage of people, even then, a majority of workers had uh, many or some knowledge tests, but that's obviously been changing, and so um, in, um, in Europe, uh, they pointed out uh, in 2010 that already at that point, 39% of EU, EU employment was knowledge intensive. Um, and it's just been increasing. This is a little bit more recent chart. Uh, you know, obviously, all these statistics take a year or so to get produced, so that's why we're never quite up to the year we're talking. But you can see about you know, non-routine non cognitive jobs and what the growth is. Um, and in fact, uh, this goes along with a bunch of changes in the nature of work, um, and so there is this kind of interesting article in, about um, how the Hollywood model may be the model for a lot of people in the future working around short-term project-based teams rather than the traditional, you know, 40-year, 9-to-5 career. Okay, the other point I'd say about this is, you know, we're all talking about the internet, and everybody's very impressed by it, and we're still in the early stages. Um, I like to th uh, think of it as we're somewhere now the equivalent of where the public telephone system was 100 years ago. Um, and there's still a lot to come. And there's a reason for that um, because we really can't do this yet. This vision is not here. Uh, it is not achieved yet where you've got high quality visual communication and collaboration everywhere. Um, but uh, and the reason that's important is for this. Um, we don't do enough visual communications. Uh, because uh, the broadband is not sustainable yet, the all kinds of restrictions occur in communications. When that happens, then it will be very much like being next to somebody. But right now, we don't really have that, and the texting and chatting and all that just really doesn't count because it eliminates an awful lot of what's normal human communications and eliminates what is often the basis for trust between people, that, that sort of visual communications that go beyond words. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's developing. So, you, you know, you got the, uh, um, you know, iPhone uh, providing um, uh, video conferencing, FaceTime. You've got uh, Google Hangouts. You've got Skype. And, you know, frankly, one of the things that's been driving the use of the Internet by grandparents is the ability to Skype with the grandkids. Um, you have all kinds of other people in various kind of chat groups like this and showing off their work. Um, in, and, and now we're beginning to get to the point where we actually can sustain uh, a large number of people uh, in, a, in an online meeting. Um, there's even this, and I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to show the video, um, but basically this is, uh, I guess, uh, Cousteau, not Jacques, but his son, who's now taking charge of the family business, um, holding a uh, live interactive video conversation from uh, the bottom of the ocean floor with schools in Serbia, London, and Washington State in the U.S., uh, if you're, you know, got a chance, you can take a look and see this video online. But it's just, I mean, it's impressive. When we say you can take it anywhere, really, you can take it anywhere. Um, there's also uh, an ability to uh, talk between languages. This is the one video I'm going to show just because it's so cute.
So, you know, you'll be able to speak in any language, and this is developing very rapidly. Um, I, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but on that Skype video, uh, it, it's a fairly impressive technological feat that they're doing there. They're actually doing speech recognition in the first language, converting it to text, then converting that to the second language in text, and then converting that to back to speech um, in, in almost real time. Um, you know, and this is beginning to happen. This is, by the way, a tool that doesn't work just with Spanish and English, but works with French and Chinese and other major languages. So that's one of the ways in which we can break down some of the barriers to communications when we do finally have it easily available. Um, oops, sorry about that. Okay, so what does this mean? Um, the game starts over for the countryside. There are changes now in communications technology and in the way the economy works that will enable small towns and rural areas to flourish again. Um, you know, the, the, the last, the previous 150 years of industrialization that really sapped the countryside of its population and a lot of economic opportunities um, is over for the developed world at least. Um, and, um, and, and now people who want to live in the countryside uh, can do that without uh, big penalties. Um, and I'll give you some examples of some of the implications. So you, I, you, I asked this question, where are securities traded? And the first thing people think about is obviously Wall Street, right? There you go. That's very densely populated lower Manhattan. And the picture above it is Wall Street. Um, the reality is that the second, that, that the biggest competition to the New York Stock Exchange is something called the Bats Exchange. And this is where they're headquartered. It's in Lenexa, Kansas. It's a temporal, well, small town. It's about 14 miles west of Kansas City, Kansas, which is not a big metropolis itself. Um, that's their downtown. If you've got the connectivity, you can go compete against the New York Stock Exchange. And it's actually, and they've been so successful that, uh, um, you know, there was, uh, I guess it was um, two years ago, July. Um, they uh, had a day in which the New York Stock Exchange had some real problems and nobody noticed. Trading went on as usual because it was just shifted electronically over the internet to places like the Bats Exchange. Um, so, you know, one of the funny things, this was a wonderful story. I keep it up here, even though it was from 2011. It was an uh, associated press story. What do you do with the Cathedral of Capitalism when it becomes antiquated? You turn it into New York's best party space. Um, and uh, I've actually been there for parties. It is fun, but it's like sad. It's a little bit like having a party at the Acropolis, I guess. Anyway, <laughs> um, the, um, so um, what I'm going to try to do now is give you some examples of what, what small towns and rural communities can do in this kind of new era. Um, um, first, they can get their piece of e-commerce. If, if, if you're connected, uh, there's no reason why people who are uh, buying stuff can't buy it from you. Uh, these are, this is data both from the U.S. on the right and from the EU. Um, on the percentage of adults who have been buying things online, it's obviously increasing. Um, and, um, and so one of the things that you can do is to, uh, is to help businesses get connected to the global economy. Um, on the right on this screen is a uh, small town in New Zealand called Wanganui. If you want to have a sense of remoteness, you need to be in rural New Zealand. Um, and, um, and they've been offering a variety of tools for their local businesses to participate in the global economy, uh, as has the Muskoka Community Network in Northern Ontario. Um, and so they're really helping their local entrepreneurs uh, figure out how to succeed uh, in the global economy uh, by, once they're connected. Um, there are some other initiatives. This one is from uh, Northern uh, Minnesota, um, you know, helping small businesses in various ways um, to uh, prosper uh, using, the, uh, using the internet. Um, and the other thing you can do is celebrate local innovators. I think this is something that too much of the story in a lot of rural areas, whether you're talking about Europe or, or North America, uh, is um, uh, stories of decline and uh, nothing goes on here that's interesting and so I think it's important for leaders to really celebrate local innovators. This is one of my favorites. That's a picture by Vincent Van Gogh. It was done about 125 years ago of um, an area in, um, in the Netherlands, um, uh, North Brabant province uh, and uh, I was there. We actually had a rural summit a few months ago um, and among other people I met was this fellow who is actually also a potato farmer, just like the people in Van Gogh's picture, except this potato farmer has sensors all over his farm and four drones and does all sorts of analytics. Um, and, uh, and this is the kind of person that uh, they are celebrating as an example of how we are innovative, even in the countryside. Um, you can also connect low-tech businesses. This is from Nova Scotia. It's one of my favorite stories. Um, it's unfor unfortunately, it ended uh, due to death, but, uh, uh, they went ahead and they did uh, broadband in rural Nova Scotia. And one of the places they dealt with one of the little firms, hardly even call it a firm, 
was DNK Bait Bags, a husband and wife team. Um, he was a lobsterman. Um, she was the wife, and the family tradition was that she knitted bait bags. Um, and, uh, and so they brought the internet there and she got a little help going online and she figured, well, maybe she could sell these bait bags to some lobsterman somewhere else in the world that didn't have a wife who knew how to do this. Um, and what happened is because she was on the internet, uh, she was discovered by a woman who owned a store on Madison Avenue in New York and said, you know, these would be delightful little night bags for my fashionable young customers. And so she ended up selling a few hundred of these every year. Uh, to a store on Madison Avenue, even though they were lobster bait bags. And this is the kind of thing that I think is important. We keep on, when we talk about these in you know, broadband and technology, we always say, hey, we're going to have programmers here. Well, there are also a lot of people who are not going to ever be programmers who can benefit from it. And this is a good example. Um, and that also, by the way, helps create models of entrepreneurship. So th once that woman was successful, another local couple in that area who made hammocks uh, said, hey, we can do this too. And they ended up uh, selling their hammocks in another shop in New York City. Um, you can develop your local workforce. One of our uh, top seven intelligent communities is Mitchell, South Dakota, a very rural place, um, best known uh, traditionally for its corn palace. Um, it's a you know quite small place, uh, maybe 20,000 people altogether uh, in, the, in their metro area. Uh, and they've really pursued the, this whole idea of training their local workforce. Um, another example of that is in Ohio, something called Digital Works that trains people to work at home, particularly in poor regions in Appalachia, the mountains and so forth, uh, and they help actually provide them with telework opportunities. So now they can you know, tend to their family and whatever they really have to do that keeps them, uh, or distance even, that keeps them from jobs, uh, and they can do that from home, and they're training people how to do this and create a home-based income. Um, and, and the need though, all this stuff is, you know, it's not just the connectivity and helping people individually, but this goes on for the whole life. And there's a whole bunch of examples, uh, some headlines I've given you about the, uh, the need for inexpensive lifelong learning. Uh, fortunately, when you uh, have the internet, you've got access to things like this. You know, you can be in the northern part of Alberta and still have access to courses that uh, are from uh, MIT and Harvard or Coursera, which includes, I guess, four dozen universities around the world now. Um, and learn what you need to. In fact, it's not even uni just universities. So there's a whole bunch of stuff. And these are just some examples of some of the things uh, that are online that will help people figure out stuff. Um, and oftentimes what I say is the local library really should help people, should, should be the guide for people to get that kind of learning that they need for a lifetime. Um, I think also encouraging innovation and creativity uh, is worthwhile. This is uh, an example from uh, the Netherlands again, I believe or maybe it's Denmark, uh, in any event, uh, they actually had uh, like a little van that went out to local areas uh, with 3D printing and so forth and other kinds of technologies to encourage people to understand, um, you know, what was out there for them that they might be able to use uh, either at the local library or the next time that the truck came around. Um, in fact, this is one of the, the 3D printing and makerspaces are, are one of the big deals, uh, especially in rural areas. The, in the U.S., um, the idea of having makerspaces and 3D printing uh, in libraries actually started in small towns. In Idaho, which is a fairly rural state in the U.S., um, they have a network of these. Um, and, uh, and, and they really picked up uh, in a variety of ways. I mean, first of all, they introduced people to technology, but they're also sort of hands-on. And as you well know, a lot of people who live in the countryside are very hands-on. Uh, this is a way that they can marry that sort of tradition uh, with modern technology. Um, you can even use data. I mean, there's all kinds of things. We hear about all sorts of uh, uh, of technologies. And again, all these things have application uh, in the countryside as well as in cities. And this is an example of big data in Minnesota. Um, I think the other thing that, 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 this, uh, that, uh, that you can do, another example you can do once you have this kind of uh, connectivity is create a delightful quality of life, which is very important. Uh, Walla Walla, Washington, uh, rural wa state of Washington in the U.S. is known for its onions, but they've been able to actually build on that um, and become a, a place that draws all sorts of people uh, because of the quality of life. Um, even where the quality of life is already beautiful, and this is a picture of Wanganui, by the way, or, or the valley that's near it, uh, with, uh, you can see Wi-Fi out in some of these um, beautiful little um, areas along the water. Um, and frankly, um, well, you can do it too. You've got gorgeous areas, all sorts of things. Uh, there's no reason why uh, you can't have this as uh, part of a connected world. Uh, and, and then let people see what it's like and encourage them to visit. And in fact, that's very much what in Europe they were doing. This is uh, from a group called uh, Inrutu, Innovation in Rural Tourism. 
uh, that it's doing exactly that, letting people see what parts of Europe that they haven't thought about to vacation uh, have to offer. And in the U.S., along the Allegheny Mountain Trail, um, they actually have done the same sort of thing. Um, you can also augment reality. This is very important and fairly easy to do. You just need to basically make sure that there's location information associated with information about uh, a community um, uh, that's online. So people can now take these one of these uh, augmented reality apps. And for example, the new iPhone uh, has it built in. Um, hold it up, and it will know the location and be able to get information about that, even video information. So on the lower right, this is um, out somewhere outside of, of uh, Albany, New York. Um, and uh, you can actually hold up your phone and see why people lived like uh, 200, 300 years ago. All sorts of ways of doing this. This is done in museums where people, you know, can get the history of the painting they're looking at or whatever. I mean, it's endless. Um, and uh, this is something that I really encourage people to do. There's not enough of it going on, and it's so easy to do. Um, small towns uh, have main streets, and that's been a big issue, uh, particularly in the age of Walmarts and such um, uh, and Amazon. But frankly, uh, the technology, if you're connected, can bring the world to small town shopping and really re help revive them. Um, and, uh, and this is an example of uh, it's a virtual mirror. Uh, it's a fairly st straightforward piece of technology in which the, the young lady here is looking in front of it and trying on dresses. Now, the dresses aren't there yet, but she can decide ahead of time if she'd like it. And then, of course, she can, you know, can buy from the store and get it shipped the same way it happens from Amazon. But this is much more interactive and much more satisfying experience. This is the kind of thing that would actually, if you had in your stores, would help bring people back there um, instead of doing the remote shipping thing. Um, there's another example. This is uh, uh, Adidas did it, their shoe wall in which they had their complete selection of shoes available. You can view them anywhere, select them out, sort of examine them, look around, um, and buy them. Um, healthcare is a big issue in, in rural communities and the countryside, um, and now you can get healthcare from anywhere. Uh, this is a particular example of a virtual intensive care unit that um, was uh, built on a model from the uh, Veterans Health Agency in the U.S., but this kind of thing is going on all over the world. Uh, actually, one of the most successful examples that I know of is in Northern Scotland, uh, where they actually had to do this sort of thing for the people who were working on the oil rigs out in the North Sea. Um, and the British healthcare system uh, built this kind of capability. In fact, you know, it's not just sort of this looking at intensive care and tracking and talking to a doctor. Uh, for example, in psychology, there's a lot of this kind of thing going on. Um, but it even can go beyond that eventually. So you might have heard of robotic surgery. You can see to the left in the picture of the surgeon sitting there and the actual ro the robot whose fingers are much more agile, small, and don't shake um, uh, is actually doing the cutting. Um, well, the uh, various uh, people have begun to experiment with this idea. Uh, why does the surgeon actually have to be in the same room? Why can't I just have a remote clinic and get the best surgeons in the world who could be anywhere um, and do the same remote surgery. Um, and in more less dramatic, but, but, but similar fashion, I, I love this story. This was very successful uh, in rural Vermont. Uh, they had a, a telecare project. And one of the things they did is they realized a lot of seniors fall um, and they wanted to help prevent that. So they ran a Tai Chi class. But, you know, during the winter in Vermont, it's pretty, the roads are pretty icy and the people are, are worried about falling. You really don't want to put them out on ice to get to a, uh, an, an exercise uh, regime. So they did this over the internet and they had basically a dozen people simultaneously doing Tai Chi to help increase their well-being and balance. And they actually did this as a medical research project and, and found that uh, it was quite successful uh, from a healthcare point of view. Okay. Um, then there's this phenomenon, which you may not have heard of, and that's moving to the countryside. Everybody hears about moving, people moving out of the countryside, and clearly there's been a decline in population and the continuing decline in the kinds of communities that are not intelligent, that are really are not taking advantage of the opportunities that are existing. But that the reverse is true, too. Um, and there is actually a, a new urban exodus, if you want to uh, call it that, because not everybody wants to live um, uh, in the country or the city, but there are enough people who want to do so um, who will re who are repopulating some of these towns. And oftentimes, these are the kinds of people who are in the digital sector of the economy. Uh, they're tech savvy, uh, their incomes are actually quite, quite good, and they can do their jobs anywhere. Um, and so this has begun to happen. There's this, uh, this study uh, about uh, a, a new urban exodus that was done uh, in Europe. Um, in the UK, um, the uh, previous chancellor of the Exchequer 
uh, noted that um, uh, there's a sharp increase. There has been a sharp increase in the number of people moving to the countryside and new businesses in rural areas there had been growing 30% in the five years from 2010 to 2015. Uh, he was proposing doing something about that from a government point of view. Um, uh, there's even uh, this fellow who's uh, Giro, who is a, uh, a well-known uh, urban planner um, and expert on exurbia. He said this, this new thing is not like what happened 20, 30 years ago where people moved to exurbia because uh, they couldn't afford to live anywhere else. These are actually rural counties and people are going there not to escape. Their, you know, they're not going there uh, because they can't afford to be anywhere else. They're going there because they want to live in a different kind of environment that they uh, that they, uh, that they need, uh, that they can find the kind of quality of life they want. Um, in France, you even have this, where uh, there's been so much of an increase in the countryside, but uh, young men still look for young women, so they set up this website for farmers to find girlfriends from the city. Uh, this is an English translation, which you will have in your deck if you're interested. Um, and then in, in, even in New York um, and other big cities, you have this phenomenon. Literally, there's a website called the Urban Excess. I'll get to that, but I want to read this first. So this is a former fashion model from Brooklyn who moved from New York City to a place with a population of 213. And she said, we looked closer and found that our friendship here, our friends up here were working for themselves, running businesses out of their homes. I became aware of the possibilities in the city being a lot more limited. And this is part of this urban exodus phenomenon. This is actually a website you can look up. Uh, they do stories featuring this uh, uh, individual uh, couples and people who have left uh, big cities um, and, uh, in fact, recently came out with a book uh, about this, a sort of guide to newcomers. Um, this is the woman behind this. Um, she actually was uh, in the tech industry in Seattle and moved to rural Maine with her husband, and this is their converted barn, right? So, and they still do farming, but they also do this. Um, and, and then there are people who live in both places, and this is one of the phenomena we don't talk about. So there are a lot of people, um, you know, not millions, but there are beginnings of a number of people um, who will spend two, three, four days maybe in uh, a place like New York City and then the remainder of the week in a rural area. Are uh, they urban residents or rural residents? Who cares, right? But you need to make sure that if you want to have those folks in your community in the rural area or a small town, uh, that you have the right kind of environment for them. Obviously, that includes broadband but includes that sense of community as well. Okay, the final thing I will go through here is, is making it global. Um, and um, uh, really it's expanding economic opportunities in and for the countryside. So I, I'm gonna, gonna make an observation. Uh, first of all, uh, most of the time when we're meeting, we're meeting with public leaders, uh, but we really wanna have what we're talking about, get beyond just the leaders to uh, encourage uh, not just leaders across the world to talk to each other, but their residents, particularly in the smaller towns, uh, to, uh, uh, to connect to each other. Uh, too much, too often, uh, when people even talk about technology and broadband, they're thinking about, well, let me use this to bring in some factory, right? Um, and, 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 and there's so much more to this. Uh, you don't need to bring in a factory to provide economic opportunity to your people. Um, and that's sort of one of the things that we've really been focusing in on recently which is enabling residents in distant communities to be virtually as close to each other as city residents. Um, and, and consider this, That's, I actually found this, I have no idea, you may know this fellow, I don't. Um, I just found an artist uh, who actually had a little bit of a presence on the internet um, and uh, lives in Banff, a beautiful town, right? Uh, this is some of the artwork. Um, and I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, how, how does somebody like that sell the artwork? Right? Well, there happens to be, um, uh, this gallery um, called Canada House. I mean, that's not a bad place, but you know, again, that's going to be limited to a fairly small amount of traffic. Um, and maybe it also limits the kind of income that he can get. Um, so, you know, he might say, how can I find, how can I market my services? Where on earth can I find somebody who can help me? Now, it may not be anybody in Alberta at all. Well, no, certainly nobody in Banff might actually have the kind of marketing skills that, that he needs to help uh, grow his business. Um, you know, he can drive to Edmonton. I did a little Google map thing here and found out it was close to four hours. Uh, if you take the fast way, um, that doesn't make for a very convenient partnership uh, with somebody providing you business services. Um, so there's the question. Maybe somebody living in another rural area, like, rural area, like this young woman, um, is actually an expert on web marketing. Why can't these two work together? Both have a need to find businesses. And so what we're saying is this can happen 
uh, we need to have a platform for this to happen, but that's not too hard. The internet has all sorts of platforms um, that will pull people together. Um, and here's an example of the kind of things that are there that include the video connections. Um, this really makes sense for the 21st century. Uh, because of all the trends that I've talked about. And I think it's worthwhile pointing out that while everybody thinks of countries in Europe and North America as being very urban, uh, they are maybe 60, 75, 80% urban. That means there's a still large population living outside those metro areas, um, and millions of people in fact. And if they were effectively brought together virtually, without actually having to move physically from places they love, that they were brought together virtually, they would achieve the same mass of a metropolitan economy. Uh, and that's what we, uh, we're trying to do. Uh, we, uh, whoops, we call this the, uh, the virtual metropolis. And you can see the image there that we're uh, trying to portray of their ability to be competitive. Um, and you can even think of it as a kind of a virtual chamber of commerce. So one of the things that I want to leave you with today as you talk to your local entrepreneurs, if anybody's interested, have them get in touch with me because uh, we want to get this thing launched. Uh, and really help people begin to get value no matter of the, from the internet, uh, no matter where they live, and help grow the local economies, and also be able to exchange with each other, not just economic goods, but cultural, educational, um, even health support. That's my quick summary. I wanted a four minutes short. Good. I, I thought I'd take 40 minutes. There you go. Um, and I wanted to have enough time for questions um, and, um, and any comments. So I would just, uh, as you said, Norman, uh, you open it up uh, for questions through the online Q&A window. But that was, that was a wonderful presentation, Norman. And uh, I'm so glad that you've extended the invitation to folks to, to reach out to you and uh, discuss the, the virtual metropolis. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. There's nothing. That, this is a this is a pretty picture, by the way. This is a barn uh, or house um, in in that same area that Vincent Van Gogh uh, used to eat at. So, <laughs> all right, here we go. Any so, questions? Uh, well, you know, some comments while we're waiting for questions to be posed, Norman. I was really impressed with that whole point that you made about seeing is believing, and that you know that. That, 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 that the, the visual, it's like the comprehension of, of visuals as uh, I think you had mentioned something like 60,000 times faster than yeah, text. Yes, absolutely. Actually, if you speak to neuro, uh, uh, neuroscientists, they would say a very large part of our brains are devoted to making sense of the visual inputs we get through our eyes. Well, and I think somewhere else in, in your presentation, I, I noted, oh, here we go. Uh, um, who will invest in such an infrastructure? Is it a uh, private-public partnership? I think that's related to the virtual metropolis. Well, well, the well, the virtual metropolis doesn't cost you very much, um, and we're we're offering that uh, uh, for free. Actually, it's just a question of uh, if people if people have connectivity, uh, they can be part of it. So that's you know that's not a charge. We really this is an, you know part of our mission. Uh, the actual investment in broadband is a different matter. Mm -hmm. And, and I, you know, I didn't go into that. Here's a limit to the time. Um, I would encourage people to do all sorts of uh, combinations, whatever works locally. So sometimes you will actually have um, a, uh, a local telecommunications company that's willing to do this. I've actually worked with a small town of 2,000 people in Mississippi, in rural Mississippi, um, uh, that worked with a local telecom provider. And they just said, look, we know exactly what we want to do with this. We have a majority of towns willing to sign up. Can you please build broadband here? And they did. Um, in other places, um, it's a joint public-private partnership, and that could take a variety of forms. Sometimes it takes the form of subsidies. Sometimes, like in Europe, in the Netherlands, it takes the form of the government building out the backbone of the network, and then the last mile, as it's called, the, the connection from that backbone to individual homes uh, and businesses is done by a private company. Um, sometimes the government itself does it. So in Chattanooga, Tennessee, uh, they have a, a city-owned Electric utility actually provides electricity not just for the city of Chattanooga, but its surrounding areas. Um, and they are the ones who did the investment uh, in the broadband. And so it's a completely publicly owned, you know, or government owned, I guess. Um, and, um, and then uh, uh, the other thing I'd say about this is one of the things that is daunting to people is what they think of as the cost of broadband. Uh, and, and I would advise everybody not to imitate the way broadband and, uh, is delivered in uh, highly dense urban areas. It's 
I won't say easy, it's never easy, but it's easier to lay fiber in downtown Manhattan than it is in a rural countryside where the density of population and customers is so much less. Um, you don't need to lay that fiber all the time. You can have a combination of technologies uh, and uh, there are some pretty impressive uh, wireless technologies. I'm not, I'm not necessarily talking about cell phone stuff, but um, even optical uh, laser beams and things like that that can carry a fair amount of, uh, of data over them without having to actually dig up uh, the earth uh, mm -hmm. and, um, and go everywhere. The other thing is to think about opportunities and, and to marry a broadband project with other things. So um, two, uh, two examples I will give you. One is whenever the local department of, who deals with highways digs up the road, they should lay conduit for fiber. Even if there's nothing in it, it's, uh, that will dramatically reduce the cost uh, because that, that uh, pathway is already there. Putting in the electrical gear later on uh, is a lot cheaper than trying to redig up the road. So if you're digging up to begin with, make sure you sort of you know, lay that foundation. The other is to think about a variety of ways in which you can uh, make this not just a broadband project, but a wider community project. So when I did my version of this in Westchester County, New York, um, more than 10 years ago, we actually made it an educational project, a healthcare project, a transportation project. We got funding from a variety of sources because it was once this thing was in place, each of them had identifiable benefits that justified their investment. Um, and, and of course, we also had a ready-made ready -made stories once the thing was running of uh, how valuable it was to the community. No, that's excellent. Now, someone has uh, asked the question, uh, can I get a link to this presentation? And I would respond that we're recording this presentation and all of our presentations are posted to our YouTube channel. So anyone can find this presentation by searching for MCCAC within YouTube. Uh, the next question I'll, I'll repeat here. This is great. Our rural towns have already a lot of infrastructure and it would be nice to make these active places again. So how, how would be a good way for government to test out the idea before a big investment, Norman? So I'm a big fan in not doing big investments. Uh, <laughs> so that's a great question. Um, yeah. Partly you're not doing big investments because nobody has the big money anymore. But, but, but more important, this is still a learning process. We are in the early stages of this digital economy, as I think I pointed out. We haven't seen the full impact yet. Um, and so, um, you know, you don't want to make a big investment that 10 years from now looks very obsolete. Uh, I think you want to start experimenting. I, th I think you can do that. Uh, as I said, one of the things that I do in our workshops is help people figure out what can we get done that doesn't cost a lot of money in the next three to six months. So stuff that will show value for this that get people to do it. I've tried to give you some examples of some of the things that, that you can do. Um, I, um, you know, and we're perfectly willing to work with communities to, uh, to help them figure this out in particular circumstances. But well, yeah, and, and but, but try to, but try to, if, if you've got a place, if, for example, if your whole town doesn't have connectivity, but some parts of it do, figure out what can go on there that will be valuable. Um, it may be something, by the way, it doesn't have to, you know, it doesn't have to be all year long and a big deal, but, but if you have, for example, a local music festival, um, why can't you share that with the rest of the world? Or even better, if some other town has a local music festival at the same time, uh, why can't you have this simultaneously occurring? And, you know, uh, one well, well, that's a superb idea, you know, Norman. And, and using technology like this, you can actually broadcast to Facebook Live or YouTube Live. So that's a wonderful idea. Yeah. But, but you guys have been at this for you know, at least a decade, right? Is that uh, more than that? Actually, ICF is more than 15 years old and their annual awards have been going on for the last 15 years. So, yeah. Well, I like we were chatting about before you, we uh, launched, uh, both the city of Edmonton and the county of Parkland have been recognized fairly recently by ICF. That's right. 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 And other places in Canada as well. It's not just, yes, exactly. Well, and in fact, I mean, you saw, I had this little thing on the upper right hand side, the uh, rural Nova Scotia was one of our top seven uh, as a result of that project. Yeah, but but you're also doing this uh, with Columbia, uh, your your day job as a prof, right? <laughs> right, that's my day <laughs> job now. Yes, yeah, and and yes, absolutely. Um, and and I'm actually among other in, in terms of the technology world, I'm actually teaching graduate students about strategy and about uh, how to lead change. So this is all very relevant <laughs> to the kind of thing that we also do with respect to communities.
So and you don't have to go into the office every day. You can telework, right? I actually, yeah. Now I think, as I think I told you before, that I was an executive at Cisco. Um, this was a company that was very much um, built around virtual workers. Mm-hmm. Um, so I seldom went to an office. Um, you know, if I if I needed the highest quality video conferencing that Cisco offered, I would go to an office. But aside from that. Um, I, I did all the work. I'll give you another example. This is uh, just to give you an indication of where the economy is going, and I'm not unusual. Um, I think as of at least a couple of years ago, IBM noted that a majority of the employees do not work uh, in a location that has IBM's name on the door. They are either working at home, or they're working at customer sites, or they're working on the road, or they're working from airports, whatever. But they're not, you know, they're they're being connected to IBM. Uh, from some non-IBM location. And the net result of this, there was a study a couple, again a couple of years ago by one of the big real estate firms that it used to be you would devote 250 square feet per employee for white collar office space. Um, and more recently it's down to 50 square feet because there are so f- many fewer people showing up to actually do their work in an office. Well, well, the other thing, and just while we're waiting for more questions to come in, Norman, I think what you guys have, have uh, learned is, is it's a combination of it's not just the technical innovation, but also kind of social and behavioral innovation to be able to take advantage of that. Yes, exactly. And, I, and by the way, that's also one of the, the reasons why uh, digital equality and inclusion is a very much part of this is because we want to make sure that the communities figure out how to get everybody involved, not just the people who can uh, most easily afford um, uh, some of this technology. Um, uh, but yeah, I, it, it's, it's, a, it, it's not just a question of building out, you know, fiber, you know, build it and they will come kind of thing. We don't believe that. Um, uh, I think our, our view is, you know, build it so that the community can be developed so that you can, you know, in, enhance the quality of life for people. Uh, they can get access to opportunities and uh, econ- uh, economic opportunities or cultural, educational, whatever opportunities that uh, from the whole world that they couldn't before. I mean, you can do things that, you know, frankly, um, uh, you know, I don't know if you, how much tourism, you know, you folks personally do. Um, I, um, I remember um, actually going to the Louvre Museum in Paris to see the Mona Lisa. That's an impossible experience. I mean, you're basically like 100 feet back because they're so worried about damage to the painting. You're better off, you know, taking a tour of the Louvre on, your, on the Internet. Mm-hmm. and staying home, <laughs> you know, but yeah, and you can now live in Northern Alberta and have that experience and in some respects have better experience than actually showing up. Now, obviously you miss other parts of Parisian life. I'm not trying to discourage people from travel, but, but I think the point though is that there's a lot of quality uh, and uh, opportunity that can come across to people who live in smaller towns um, than, used to, you know, which wasn't the case in the more recent past during our industrial era. So, so you could actually have tourism webinars, kind of like kicking the tires, uh, taking a test test drive of uh, the tourism experience. Absolutely, and some places that you know, particularly uh, areas, for example, that have um, um, trails uh, or outdoor recreation, oftentimes will just put webcams out and let people see what it's like. Mm-hmm. Right? It doesn't. I mean, a webcam is nothing. Uh, you know, it's like fifty dollars uh, U.S. It's uh, you know, it doesn't cost much money, and you just put it out there, and as long as you got some kind of connectivity, people can see, hey, that really looks gorgeous. And it's like that picture I had uh, from the river in Alberta. Um, you know, let's, you know, that'll attract people. Some people say, hey, you know, let's think of a place that, you know, we haven't gone to that's really interesting. So if, if people, you know, and, and, and our, our audience it represents basically all levels of government, you know, so, you know, whether it's municipal or provincial or, or federal. So if they wanted to reach out and kind of do a, a partnership as, as this last question had kind of proposed uh, Norman, what, what would the, the right way to, to do that be? Um, well, at the end of my uh, presentation, I gave my content information. It's very simple. It's N Jackness, N J A C K N I S at intelligentcommunity.org. Oh, here's another interesting uh, question here. There could be a shared office where people could rent the space and use the boardroom or coffee or network with others, even when their work isn't uh, related. Uh, that's right. Uh, yeah, yes. So, and that's kind of thing. A lot of places have set up these uh, office spaces um, in, in, in densely populated urban areas. It's usually done by private sector companies who are you know, basically landlords. But I've seen this in a lot of places that are, are not big cities where the government basically creates an entrepreneur space, a hacker space, sometimes they call it, 
Um, yes, you bring people from diverse backgrounds, which is, by the way, helpful for innovation as well, because people are there, they exchange ideas. Uh, absolutely. It's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kind of thing. And by the way, if you've got any empty office space or any, and frank, even front door space, you know, retail space um, in your, in your downtown, don't let it stay empty. See if at least, you know, while it, before it gets leased out again, it can be used for this purpose. No, oh, that's an excellent idea, Norman. That's great. So, uh, I would just like to thank you on behalf of uh, our audience. This has been a fantastic uh, presentation. And, and like I mentioned to folks, we will be uh, posting it to our YouTube channel, which you guys can find in YouTube just by searching for MCC, MCCAC. This has been a fantastic presentation, Norman. Thanks so much for well, thank, agreeing to do this. Well, thank you for listening to me. And, and please encourage your entrepreneurs uh, to uh, get in touch with me as well. I'd uh, love, well, love to have uh, folks from Alberta participate in this uh, global virtual metropolis. Absolutely. And maybe we can win another, uh, another award. <laughs> well, maybe even better yet, um, um, <laughs> win a better life for people who live in Alberta. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everybody. Thanks bye -bye. so much, Norman. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye now.